हेलो सलाम शलोम नमस्ते ओला बुना एंड प्रीवियस इट्स रियली रियली गुड टू बी विद यू एंड आई एम श्योर यूल बी सो हैप्पी यूर ज्वाइनिंग अस टुडे बिकॉज यू हैव अ वेरी स्पेशल गेस्ट इट्स टेरी बेबर्स हु इज अ कोच सल्टेंट to multi passionistas and if you are not entirely sure what that means yet don't worry i'm going to invite terry in just a moment to tell us more about who she is and what she does so welcome terry oh thank you so much i i was so honored when you invited me to be part of your uh vlog your podcast <laughs> this is very exciting Yes, I'm so happy you are here. And you know, I'm really looking forward to what we're going to be talking about because you are one of the very few people that I have met honestly that actually works with what we are calling or you're calling multi-passionistas, right? And I'm definitely amongst the <laughs> stuff so you are my kind of people and i'm yeah. sure that lots of our audience are also multi passionistas so please tell us more about who you are and what you do so you may have also heard terms like renaissance soul or multi potentialite or polymath and those are all different labels i call us leonardo style thinkers as well um those are all different labels that we can use to identify ourselves as people with too many passions to pick just one and so we don't and we become an expert in many areas many areas really diverse areas like leonardo da vinci yeah. right that's right that's right <laughs> yeah I so remember. yeah you said to, to tell me a little bit about myself or what uh, just along those lines when i was in um 8th grade or no 8th not 8th grade my junior year of high school they wanted us to to pick what we're going to do for the rest of our life so we can of course pick the right college to apply and narrow it down and pick it yeah. and in those days no internet we had a great big uh catalog of professions and trades to leaf through and discover and i just couldn't figure it out and i will never forget my teacher she had fingernails and lipstick this color and she's pounding her fingernail on that book saying you've got to pick one terry just do it pick one so you can move forward with your life and it was that's just so crushing that's why it's important to me that i provide a should free zone for my clients so they don't have to figure out what they should be doing with their life and and the turning point for me I ended up going to dental hygiene school of all things and now oh, that's a whole I did it because a my boyfriend fiance was going to dental school and b I thought I didn't have to do much math that's one of the passions I don't have <laughs> but I was a dental hygienist in in Washington DC and I knew I didn't want to do it any longer so I went to a place called the Johnson O'Connor Research Foundation to try to figure it out and they do um evidence based uh research around what characteristics people have who are very satisfied in their own profession and um the characteristic that really gave me so much hope and excitement was this thing called ideaphoria that's the rate of flow of ideas uh-huh and everybody has idea for you i just happen to have high 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 idea for you like 99.9 percentile idea for you and that's not saying i had adhd yeah it's just very exciting for me to hear that this is a characteristic of of people who are very creative and have a high rate of flow of ideas and and that made me feel a little bit less like i should be doing something that everybody wanted me to do. And so that's how I of course I was a hygienist for 20 years. That didn't work out very well. I was miserable. And then I went to university on my divorce and then I discovered coaching in 2003. 
and the world opened up to me. It just opened. That's amazing. And wow. You, yeah, like I said, you're my kind of people. <laughs> so you're a Renaissance soul and a multi passionista. Oh, so much so, for sure, for sure. Like I, you know, I say that I've been blessed with a generally very excellent brain and it just loves to learn and it's so good at so many things. And like literally when I was in college, I didn't want to stop being a student. You know, I was like, oh my gosh, exactly in the same boat as you were in terms of feeling a certain sense of societal pressure <laughs> to choose something i was literally in the last semester of like when i was supposed to graduate and i had like no idea not that i didn't have no idea what i wanted to do i had way too many ideas of what i wanted to do that's the that's the issue that's the idea for you hey thanks for tuning into this episode Hope you're getting value out of it. For your information, this episode has been sponsored by the Happiness 101 program. Are you a change maker, coach, trainer, or healer? Are chains of fear holding you back from making the impact and income you desire? Using a unique combination of positive psychology and the spiritual wisdom of our most effective change makers, the Happiness 101 program helps you break through your limiting beliefs and manifest the abundance and success you desire with fun and ease. Interested? Book a free Happiness 101 exploration call with me, your happiness expert, Samya Vano. Just use my online calendar link in the show notes. Now back to the show. That's <laughs> right. That's right. And so it wasn't until I was literally in my last uh, semester of or rather quarter of college that I ended up in this amazing class and was actually called the most effective methods of creating social change and turned interesting out interesting title right and it was being taught through the environmental studies department and it was a one of the most unusual classes i've ever taken and it actually ended up being structured almost like a leadership development course where they had us like go through all kinds of different learnings and exercises and of course we were also learning about the most effective methods of creating social change but you know one big aspect of that we were learning about was that you have to be really creative i mean if you're going to tackle some of the biggest problems in the world that society has been entrenched with maybe for decades and centuries you have to get creative about it you know, yeah. and so we did so much learning around how to just enhance our creativity and come up with creative solutions. And then they asked us, OK, also to create like a blueprint of like a organization that we might want to start in order to solve the world challenges that we wanted to solve. And I was like, OK, there isn't just one challenge that I want to solve but the good thing was our teacher didn't restrain us he was like but Samia why should you restrict yourself to solving just one challenge because if you really look at it one of the keys to creating most effective change is to recognize how interconnected and interdependent everything is one issue is never just one issue Mm -hmm. And if you can see that, that's actually a brilliant thing. That's right. And what's so brilliant is that 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 what he talked about the interconnectedness, the the interweaving, yes. um, the warp and the weft, and then you know going. It just all of that, not only of the problems, mm. but of the potential solutions. Yeah. 
it's like crossing industrial boundaries. We have all these different professions and industries that we go into environmental engineering. We go into so, uh, law, family law. We go into uh, dental hygiene. And, and by the way, I have had clients who are lawyers, interior yeah. designers, and a dentist. Same person. And so all three of those things can weave together to create yes. the solution to create the positive change. That's right. And that's why it's so brilliant to, for us to gather together as a type of person. Um, I don't like to call like-minded people because we're not like anybody. <laughs> but people who, who recognize themselves when they hear the word multi-passionista, they go, oh, that's got to be me. When we can connect with other people like us who allow us to create a should-free zone, yeah. we can stop being, um, stop caving into the social pressure to do it the way it's always been done. That's then right. we can get truly creative. Now, here's, here's how I, one of the things that I think is important. Mozart was a very creative person. Yeah. Oh my gosh, he was so creative. But he was creative in one industry, in one profession. He leaned his ladder against that wall over there and climbed up to the top of it. And oh, he may have, you know, had a had a risers to go over to a different kind of music, but it was the same thing for him all over the place. Leonardo da Vinci was in one of those libraries that was stealing the floor books and and it had ladders with scaffolding that were on rollers and move around from one, one piece of knowledge and experience to the next. That's a different kind of creativity. That's right. That's and that's the creativity of the multi-passionista, of the neo-generalist, the uh, polymath, somebody who's, an, who's a boundary crosser. We don't live in silos. Yes. Exactly. So this, Boundary crosser. did this teacher, um, so where were you tempted to go from that class? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I came up with this vision. I was like, you know what? Because there's so much to learn and education is at the core of how you have to, you know, even begin the process of creating change in the world. Mm -hmm. Why don't I establish like a school are some kind of educational institution where people can come and learn everything that they need to learn about life and living with inner peace and happiness and joy. Because, you know, we have, of course, our universities where people can come and learn everything when it comes to academic subjects. So and those everything tends to, to zero in on everything, 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 smaller, 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 more and more. Yes. And all the, everything about one thing. But we don't want to do that. I'm I sorry, I interrupted know. you. No, you're academy. absolutely right. Because, <laughs> and it wasn't always like this in the way that our educational system worked, the universities work. You know, I mean, if you look at the philosophers of all, like Leonardo da Vinci, for example, I mean, my gosh, they deliberately, they, they studied a wide variety of subjects, and they tried to study a wide variety of subjects so that, you know, they could have as broad an understanding of the universe as possible, and world and life as possible, so that when they were trying to come up with their solutions, you know, they would be able to be as effective as possible. But in modern world, you're absolutely right. There's been this drive to make everyone a specialist and the generalists, um, as they're called, are devalued. Like the, the, the doctors who are general practitioners, <laughs> they're being devalued. They're being paid less. Although, like if all you ever do is go to specialists, healthcare professionals you're actually going to ruin your health more you need general practitioners you need these doctors with a more holistic perspective mm -hmm. on, on your body and your health to truly be able to help you and I mean there's so many examples like that and you know it's like that with our education as well 
and I see like so many gaps in in the education that we need especially in the context of life wisdom life knowledge you know and I was like let's fill in all these gaps and so that's how I actually started my business and so you went from that class and that blueprint that he assigned to you to create to create your own academy yeah your business now let me ask you this when i was looking through your um i guess it was your bio i saw that you use a lot of positive psychology yes um, now have you studied through a, a, a university of positive psychology so I was a psychology major in uh -huh. college. And then after I graduated with my bachelor's in psychology, I actually took a year and a half long training that was focused on applied positive psychology. And through what school was that? That was through a private um, uh, institution, actually. Uh -huh. It wasn't even an institution. She was my happiness coach, Dr. Amy uh -huh. Corget. And she's, to be sure, one of us as well, uh, you know, in terms of being a multi-passionista. And so she had established her own, uh, she called it positive leadership, positive, was it Positive Leadership Institute or positive uh -huh. leadership something. But you took uh, that night, that 15 months. Yes, yes. And so I was studying directly with her. Um, and she had created this really brilliant curriculum that, uh, you know, was to teach you, number one, how to teach positive psychology in a very, very practical way to mm -hmm. people so that they could utilize it in their everyday lives to take charge of their happiness. And then she also trained you in the sort of like the coaching aspect of <laughs> you know, the, the business side of how mm -hmm. you set up your coaching practice and so forth. Oh, that's wonderful. Brilliant mix. And because she is such a multi-passionista as well, of course, she advertised. Her primary advertising was about positive psychology. Uh -huh. <laughs> but once we got into her program, we were learning about nutrition. She was like, you have to do exercise. You have to go outdoors in nature. And then oh, she's yeah. also like an energy, amazing energy healer. She's the one who introduced me to energy healing. You know, it's a very, very uh, much more than just positive psychology, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I think that the, the thing that's so powerful to me about the concept of positive psychology is that instead of looking at all the symptoms of what's wrong with a person or all the symptoms of what's wrong with a community, yes. they teach us to look at all the symptoms of what's right with our life yes. and come up with a diagnosis that some would call a solution, some would call a pattern, a discovery of patterns. Yes. But instead of looking at everything that's wrong, which was what the medical model is, right. which is what therapists generally do. I think therapists are more and more moving toward positive psychology, but still the coaching industry has made a huge impact, huge impact on the way um, problems are solved for both humans and communities. Yeah. And, and that's because they, I don't even want to say solution focused because it's not focused on solutions because looking at solutions implies problems. That's right. Which isn't what so positive psychology is about looking at strengths and gifts and talents yeah. and um, assets. What are the assets that this person or this community has? And if you want to create positive change, I mean, change is going to happen. And we yeah. either uh, allow it to happen by default, whatever change happens, happens, or we impact it yeah. to create positive change, utilizing what's positive already there in the community and yes. what other positive things we can bring to the community. Yes. And, you know, so there's a, exactly like you were saying, there's this aspect of looking at what's right, what's positive, 
uh, like what are the assets that you have and building on those to create a solution. But then positive psychology also has this other amazing layer of teachings that can help us create positive change, right? In the sense of, so this is actually something that I was learning back when I was at, um, um, at UCLA and I was taking that class in the most effective methods of creating social change. So by the way, my teacher for that, also a multi, well, fashionista. Yeah. I don't know if that's the correct gender for, for Yes, and, and that's one of the problems with that label. It sounds too feminine, but that's okay. Is that it's okay? okay. Lights, Renaissance cool. soul, polymath, whatever. <laughs> awesomeness, awesomeness. So he was also one of us, by the way. And so in his research, because you know, he was a PhD, um, his research was all focused on the most effective methods of creating social change. And so he being the multi-passionista that he is, um, also brought together, like he was able to see like so many different influences that influence the most effective change makers, you know? And one of the things that he identified was their utilization of positive psychology combined with principles and the philosophy of nonviolence. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he like brought this insight to me because, you know, a lot of people who are in the nonviolence movement are actually using methods of nonviolence to create change. They're using methods that are physically nonviolent, but they're not committed to nonviolence as a philosophy, as an ethic in all areas of their life. And so at a mental, emotional level, for example, they may not be applying nonviolence. So it's like not going to use violence at a physical level, but mentally, emotionally, they're blaming, judging, shaming the Mm -hmm. opponents, you know, or the people that they disagree with. So they're on that constricted catabolic level of energy, emotional and thought thinking and behaving yes rather than the expansive more uh, yeah yeah and so you know when you think start to think about positive psychology and using that in combination with nonviolence, you're like ah you look at certain instance uh, like certain models of like um like martin luther king like gandhi like jesus um who were like amazing models of not only being nonviolent at a physical level, but they were actually ethically, morally, philosophically committed to nonviolence in all aspects of their life. So they also taught us to be mentally and emotionally and spiritually nonviolent. Mm. And that's why you have, you know, teachings from Gandhiji, from Martin Luther King, from Jesus, like, love your enemy. <laughs> Mm. right and so when you begin to think about how do I actually practically love my enemy look in positive psychology like if you don't want to look in in religion if you don't want to look in like the the more religiously worded teachings of faith traditions look in positive psychology positive psychology teaches you how to practice non-judgment for example, mm-hmm. right? I mean, my gosh, you know, and so practicing non-judgment um, makes you mentally and emotionally nonviolent, you know? <laughs> so, so that suddenly it occurred to me, and this is for a different topic, I'm sure, yeah. but <clears throat> I wonder if there's a way to talk about practicing nonviolence without saying nonviolent because our brain doesn't hear the non in front of the violent when we say nonviolent communication yeah. our inner brain really only hears the violence it doesn't hear the non in front of it so i for a different just topic i would like to talk to you about how we can um shift the language a little bit to say what we want to say without 
tweaking our making our brain and our emotions tweak to yeah. that yeah you know the exact problem that you are pinpointing a lot of people have been recognizing it it's just that in some ways the language of nonviolence, uh, that terminology has stuck and so yeah it's um, hard to change it, it's hard to change and at the same time uh, alternatives have been coming up so for example um, I've been hearing a lot of uh, the coaches in my world right talking about compassionate communication there you go talking about courageous conversations talking about so my teacher at UCLA he uses the word transformative action and transformative communication. Oh, that you know? much wonderful, much wonderful. Yeah. Those all are, are I mean, of, of course, I mean, and I, as a, I, I'm a coach sultant, um, language, we're talking again about language, um, but my, not but, and my goal is to guide people to transform themselves to first lead themselves and transform their life so that they can create positive change rather than accept by default whatever change comes their way that's right that's right and and the reason i say coach sultan is because i not only coach which is one that that's one skill set and one educational expertise but i'm also a consultant and as a consultant, I do a lot of teaching and I, I do a lot of research and I may advise people to um, seek certain resources and I offer resources. That's not coaching. Yes. But right. it's really, really important to help people get past the language that they're used to using, wow. the concepts they're used to experiencing, like nonviolent. So that's why for me... Um, I like to call, I talk about a should free zone um, because this is a, I, I want to create a place where, where we're not compelled to do something in order to be accepted and yes. respected and yes. honored and listened to. And in order to, to be able to have influence on the world, people uh, we, we want people to respect us. And so we follow all the shoulds because we think they're going to only respect us if we do what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. That making sense? I mean, I can see I get really passionate yeah. about that. Oh, my gosh. It <laughs> making total, total, total sense to me. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but just in terms of keeping my eyes on the clock. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Us. Somewhat different question. I'm going to ask okay. you a somewhat different question. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the specific programs that you have or some specific ways in which you actually work with people? Because, my gosh, yes, I think people would love to understand that aspect of who you are and what you do even more. Um, well, I do use a lot of assessments and I prefer using evidence-based assessments such as the VIA survey of character strengths. That is, it's different from the Gallup uh -huh. survey. Uh, character, the, the, the Gallup strengths are designed for workplace strengths and they're, it's designed to look at talents and skills, whereas character, and that's what you do. Yeah. The character strengths looks at how you do it. That's right. The character strengths looks, and uh, like I said, it, it is evidence-based, so it's based on solid scientific, peer-reviewed, uh, empirical research. And so, I, so all that doesn't get people too excited, except it's, it gives people such a cool, amazing understanding of who they are. And that's my main goal in my programs is to help people get clear on who they're created to be. Because when you know who you're created to be, even though you want to do 30 things now and 
15 things next month and 70 things the month after that, when you know who you're created to be, then it's easier to begin to do what you're created to do. Because you're created to be interested in all of those things. Mm. And you're created to be curious. Oh, you, pro- you have amazing curiosity as yeah. a multifashionista yeah. and love of learning. And so you want to learn all of this stuff, but you don't necessarily want to do all of this. Yeah. How do you decide? You want to lead yourself. And I, I have a program that I call FLY. First, lead yourself. <laughs> and you can be a better influencer and a better leader of others when you can lead yourself. And the only way I believe that you can effectively lead yourself is when you know yourself. Yeah. And these assessments really help you zero in on who you are when you're at your best. Yes. I have taken that uh, assessment on multiple occasions, actually. It was one of the assessments that my UCLA professor had us do, too by the way. Um, so it's been around for a while. And like you said, very mm-hmm. thoroughly tested and proven to be an effective tool. Um, and you know, one of the things that I enjoy the most about the character strengths test is that you just get such an amazing happiness boost. Yes, because, yes. you know, you're like, Oh, my gosh. Yes, these are all these amazing strengths that I have. And my gosh, I'm such an amazing being. And even out of the 23, 24 strengths, even my 24th strength isn't a weakness. It's That's simply, right. it's simply a strength that doesn't, um, doesn't put me in the zone of happiness when I, when I utilize it. Oh, can, may I tell you a quick story? Yes. Please. I use this via survey of character strengths. I, I, I use it in group training and in uh, communication, uh, conflict, coaching, etc. And I was coaching a team of nonprofit leaders here in Fairbanks, who there are about 14 of them, who had been working together for years. And suddenly, about two years ago, they started having all kinds of conflict. Mm. So they brought me in to help them with that. And I administered the, the via survey of character strengths as a team report. And what we discovered is that uh they're ac- almost across the board everybody had had um honesty as a top oh. strength isn't that wonderful yes. everybody, almost everybody had honesty um no one not one person had social intelligence and only two had kindness oh and so so you can be all kinds of honest, but if you haven't learned how to activate one of your lower strengths, yeah. then it causes problems. And what had happened two years previous is that they lost a couple of, of uh, board members. Yeah. And so they brought in new board members. And it's natural for people, they didn't ask, are you honest? But it's natural for people to draw, they call it like-minded, to draw yeah. other people who are like them. So the, the new people they brought on, I guess they lost about four members. Anyway, the new people they brought on all had honesty as their top. And, and it turns out that the people who had left they, did, they had honesty as one of their middle strengths. It's not they were dishonest, but they, because one of the exercises I do is strength spotting. So people learn how to look at behaviors yeah. and um, countenance to see what other people have as strengths. And as they reviewed all of this, they discovered, oh, Georgiana, she was social intelligence, tip top strength. And Christine had kindness. And, and perspective was another one that, that left. And so with those three leaving and all these honest people, does my butt look back in this? Yes. <laughs> it, it just, it, people didn't know how to temper. Right. Because they were so happy when they were being honest that they yes. didn't have the perspective or the social intelligence to temper their honesty. Yeah. And, and this helps with our own internal uh, communication as well. When we're being doing our intrapersonal communication, 
we it, and we understand what our strengths are, it gives us an understanding of how to activate them for our best interests and for our community's best interests. Yes. It's yes. Oh, so exciting. And and um, so you asked all the things that I do. I'm not going to tell you all of them. That's one of them. Is I, I administer what I call the Lola, and that's the lens on life, leadership, and attitude. And it's a series of assessments and journaling prompts. The other thing I love to do is host idea parties. Mm. Those of us who have high idea phoria really love being able to dive into an idea, especially to help other people dive into their ideas. That's right. And, and it's just fabulous. You come to an idea party with an idea. This is what I want. And here are my obstacles. And then everybody in the group, this is a, a but-free zone. It's a should-free zone. You're not allowed to say, yeah, but people begin offering resources and yeah. knowledge and wisdom and solutions emerge. And it's so much fun. Yeah. That's something I like to do with my, with my group um, and reading. So I, I, I guess my, my main program is called, one of my programs is FLY, First Lead Yourself, and that's sort of a subset of my larger program, which is the Multipassionista Success Team. Nice. And, and it's, it's about having us work together to create that should-free zone, um, knowing who we are at the core and knowing who our community members are at the core so that we can collaborate and we can weave together um, a better world yeah. for ourselves, for our business, for our family. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. And, you know, on that very amazing positive thought of just weaving a better world for all of us, and just doing that from that place of creativity and strength and owning our being masters of many. Yes. <laughs> and being multi-passionistas and so forth. Um, I just want to remind all of our listeners to make sure you check the show notes because we're going to be adding Terry's links in the show notes. So you can connect with her and uh, get her support, get her help. Whenever you're ready for it, I'll also be dropping my links in there. So get in touch. Um, and yeah, until we connect next time, I just wish you lots and lots of peace and joy. Yes, God bless you, Samya. <laughs>